revisiting all these people's stories in this coherent fashion that they all came together and gave their formal opening statements and presentations in a very formal, concise man manner. Um, it's just phenomenal to have all these people in one room at one room at the same time. And what I'm getting from it, ultimately, is that everyone is understanding the same thing. And what that thing is is that this is a planetary situation and our society is on the border of being ready for this kind of information and beyond the information ready for what it actually implies uh, when it comes to the level of technology and, and responsibility that comes with that technology that our civilization is going to have to have if this information is and when it is disclosed and so I feel like all the researchers who've been in this field of researching for 30, 40, 50 years all understand that critical, critical point. I think it's good that, that, that we're bringing about this information in a way where people can, uh, you know, talk about the whole UFO ET thing from more of a, uh, uh, just listening to everyone's stories. They're all normal people. These are people who, you know, have families and and live their lives, you know, like, like all of us, you know, daily, day-to-day -day life, you know, on the surface of the earth, you know. And uh, they have amazing stories. And I know a lot of us out there have amazing stories. And we need to share them. You really need to share them at this time, because now is a time, by you sharing your stories, it really, really um, stimulates and causes ripples beyond what we can see. And it changes uh, the discussion over time. And ultimately, it will lead to one thing. It will lead to everyone being on one accord, on one same page. And, uh, and so I'm totally glad, once again, to be participating in this particular uh, uh, phase of it. And um, I just tell you guys, you guys, you guys watch this, there's going to be some amazing information in here. It was uh, it's an honor to participate in in editing and sharing his uh, one of his last uh, messages, which I think I feel is so packed with truth. Uh, it's just an honor to participate and, and have edited this and sharing this out with the public. And I think that it really holds a really true message that um, we really uh, really need to listen to. And I think it gives us from his age of wisdom. Um, it gives us more of a, uh, what I like to focus on is a more of a triangulated perspective. So instead of him saying, you know, the government versus the people or some type of uh, thing like that, his perspective is uh, very, uh, very simple, very common sense, very uh, uh, process oriented. And uh, if you watch the video, uh, you'll see that what he, what he states is, is full of so much love, you know. He says, uh, Every civilization in their scientific development, which is really just an expression of their awareness of their environment, planetarily speaking, um, they go through a, a nuclear age. Uh, some civilizations uh, um, experience a speed bump there, uh, and that speed bump could, uh, could look like people gone, right? Um, but these, as he said, he says, every civilization goes through this period um, where they can either make it through the nuclear age or, or, or necessarily not at that particular time. And uh, I think that's just so powerful because he's saying that these other beings, uh, other planetary civilizations who have uh, the level of sophistication intellectually to be able to travel from planet to planet or star system to star system or multiverse to multiverse, etc., um, they surpass their nuclear age. So that's a level of, of, of intelligence right there. Not just intellectual intelligence, but emotional intelligence. The fact that you don't want to blow up your neighbor. That's pretty emotionally intelligent. And so he points that out, that that's actually the message that they're showing us. By showing us, look, hey, we can just disappear like that. We can accelerate from zero to 100,000 miles per hour immediately, instantaneously with no sound and no need for any big rocket or flames come out the back or etc. And um, he's, what they're saying is that they survived this particular period that we're going through called the nuclear age. 
and using that as hope and inspiration that obviously, guys, with developing and cultivating and refining ourselves uh, intellectually and emotionally, we can escape the duality of blowing people up, get more towards a um, triangulated perspective and survive this nuclear age and be uh, uh, in the scriptures as they call it, um, in all the scriptures, uh, they call it being stewards of the universe. And so, uh, you know, curators in other words. We can be a, a, a planetary civilization once again. And we're just going through that process right now of, of understanding how to process our reality. So, Jesse said it all in his video and uh, he so, uh, so, you know, I felt his energy here with this man while we were editing this. It was just, just great, man. His message was so universal and he just encapsulated it all. And, and that even at the end, just so powerfully stated, you know, it's not about if disclosure as far as, you know, someone coming out like he said he didn't care if it happened before he passed away or not you know he's already he already knows it for himself now that is the powerful part you know and once again a note on disclosure you know disclosure is a process it's not something that happens overnight this is the process of disclosure you listening right now and doing what you do in your life is the process of what we're calling disclosure this is a, a process of uplifting our consciousness becoming more aware and developing more emotional and intellectual intelligence okay and so this is uh, something that is inevitable and that is a natural process this is not a, uh, a a war it seems to be a war but it's a natural process that we're going through right now as a as what, what seems to be a species and so um, it's a one-way path we're all gonna make it through this and you know Thank you, Jesse, for, uh, for your beautiful message and blessings to the Marcel family. The Citizen Hearing on Disclosure was a great success. Uh, it was webcast to the world, it was filmed, and we have 30 hours of testimony. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to take all this to Capitol Hill. We've created a section on the website where people can get involved in a congressional hearing initiative. Uh, I'm going to go back to Washington for the first time in 13 years uh, in my capacity as a registered lobbyist on this issue. We're going to seed the hill with this testimony, this extraordinary testimony, and we're going to send 5,350 DVDs to Capitol Hill. And what they're going to watch is this extraordinary testimony being presented to these former members of Congress, and these members of Congress get really seriously interested. And obviously the connection is there. And then I'm going to show up saying, look, it's time for the real hearings. It's time to have these witnesses and many of the others ready to testify under oath in front of House and Senate committees. And it's a compelling argument. I'm going to be working directly out of Washington, contacting these offices, setting up meetings for as many months as it takes to get those hearings initiated. Once those hearings begin, the truth embargo is pretty much finished. Either Obama or another uh, head of state will finally go in front of their people and say, look, you're not alone in the universe. We've got company now, all right? And we can tell you about that, can't tell you everything, uh, and we'll be in the post-disclosure world. There's a whole new world on the other side of the event we call disclosure, not the least of which is the revealing of what progress the government has made in re-engineering and studying the extraterrestrial technology that they've had in their hands for decades through crash vehicles. This technology, the energy systems, the propulsion systems could solve a lot of our problems, could change the dynamic of the 21st century. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the kind of stuff that will change people's lives, that will, you know, drop the price of energy possibly by 90, 95 percent, putting trillions of dollars back into the public domain to be used for other things. Phasing out a fossil fuel as the principal energy source, which allows us to clean up the environment in ways we can only dream of. That's why we need people to get involved now. Anybody that has been aware of this issue, that wants the truth out the American people, but have been sort of on the fence of whether they want to get involved, now is the time to get on board.
moving right along, Earthlings are still far away from making any sort of interaction with alien life forms, but experts are urging for the creation of guidelines if and when we do make contact. Something like Star Trek's Prime Detective. Nerd alert! Like the of course, you know of the Prime Directive, which tells us that we have no right to interfere in the natural evolution of alien worlds. Now, I have sworn to uphold it. Like the, prime blah, like the Prime Directive, the guidelines being proposed would govern the way future people engage with aliens. A panel at Starship Congress, the first ever international assemblage of space experts, discussed the importance and necessity of a rulebook. During the discussion, Kelvin Long, founder of Project Icarus, he said, in the event that we discover evidence of intelligent life on another world, that will be a social cultural and technologically influential event to human affairs which will need to be managed with great care and to ensure a culture and their culture remain intact and not disrupted by this new knowledge. Now the panel brought up the jarring effects that Europeans brought to the New World and how guns, disease, and steel shocked the newly discovered Americas. But according to Live Science, despite all the ideas thrown around for strict guidelines, the expert panel acknowledged that it's essentially ungovernable and will be up to the discretion of any intergalactic team. And as any Star Trek fan could tell you, just because the Prime Directive exists doesn't really mean they follow it. ...military base in the world. As the I-Team first reported last week, it appears that a lot of the work underway at Area 51 is on hold for now. But that doesn't mean there's nobody home. George Knapp has the story. A high-tech sentinel is silhouetted atop a ridge adjacent to the best-known entrance point to Area 51. On the flip side of that gravel roadway, the telltale vehicle of the omnipresent camo dudes, the security force that patrols the perimeter of the Groom Lake facility to keep the curious out. Even with the unavoidable warning signs, hidden sensors, and armed security teams, there are still some who think the government shutdown might be a once-in-a-lifetime chance to slip onto the base and see what's going on. Security is actually more intense than it was um, because people do expect there to be nobody there. Connie West doesn't work at Area 51, but she presides over the unofficial clearinghouse for all things related to the mystery base, that is, the Little Ailey Inn in nearby Rachel. For 24 years, it's been a place where Groom Lake workers grab a beer or a bite, especially those employees who live in Lincoln County. West says her customers have been out of work since October 1st. Most of my county is unemployed. The work there. They're unemployed right now because they're government contractors. So yeah. Do they come in and tell you, hey, we're, we're off until uh, this gets settled or, or what? You kind of sort of are. They don't have to tell you. You kind of sort of know the cars are at home. They're at home. Right. Some are in a massive depression. Some are scrambling. Two Groom Lake employees confirmed to us off camera they were let go on the first, along with a few hundred co-workers. One confirmation of that is the lot where the locals park when they get on the bus to head into the base. It's been empty. The private airfield near McCarran Airport, the one with the ominous warning signs, is traditionally how Las Vegas employees get to Groom Lake, but aviation watchers say there have been few, if any, of the Janet flights since the first. They add that other than a few unidentified flapping objects, there's been little aerial activity of any kind in the area, which is unusual for Rachel. A recent popular science article speculated about the exotic planes being developed at Area 51 these days, an invisible unmanned fighter, for example, or a special ops infiltrator craft. Whatever they're testing up there seems to be grounded for now. In a sparsely populated area like Lincoln County, the loss of a few hundred jobs is a big deal. Many of the locals who work there aren't scientists, they're construction workers who live paycheck to paycheck, and they're hurting. Hey, Connie, we've got some firewood for sale. Do you need, a, do you need any firewood? Really? I need to feed my kids. Of course, I'll buy your wood. West says her customers are crossing their fingers, hoping the stalemate in Washington can end soon so they can get back to the jobs they can't talk about at a base that doesn't exist. George Knapp, 8 News Now. Hotel and motel occupancy in towns like Beatty are reportedly down to about 15 percent because contractors aren't going to work at the base. The Air Force does not answer questions about Area 51, but it's believed there are about 2,000 employees at any given time. 
Kristen, 6.05 now. 17 News received a lot of calls from viewers about a mysterious bright light shining in the sky over Bakersfield for the second straight night. Take a look for yourself. Last night, that light was clearly visible in the southwestern sky. Observers thought it was too bright to be a star, too still to be an aircraft, and it also changed colors. So what was it? When you look at it through your naked eye, you just see a bright light. But when you look at it through the scope, it pulled everything up. We could see everything. It split. It changed shapes. It was, I don't know what it was. Amateur astronomer Darren Nunn says he watched the light as it suddenly darted off. A source at Meadows Field told 17 News no pilots have asked about it. So tell us what you think and check out the discussion going on on our Facebook page. A lot of people commenting, but no one seems to have a good answer for it yet. Mm -hmm. Since the beginning of the new millennium, a series of freak storms of red, blood-like rain have unleashed panic across the globe. In Sri Lanka in 2012, blood rain fell sporadically for 60 days. In Sri Lanka, people collect the rain for their drinking water. The local villagers fear the red water is contaminated. The government steps in to try and stop the growing panic. Well, a team of six specialist doctors have been appointed by the Ministry of Health to investigate the red rain experience in the Savanagala area. The government begins an urgent investigation. They rule out desert dust, blood cells, and algae. Now, the researchers think they're close to one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science. This is potentially an extraterrestrial organism. Whatever's in the blood rain is alive. Yet unlike all known life on Earth, it's replicating without DNA. Could these tiny cells actually be alien? One clue is spotted a week before the red rain downpour in Sri Lanka. Villagers report seeing strange lights in the sky. A week after the strange lights appear, it starts to rain. Red rain. Professor Chandra Wickamasinga thinks that there's a connection between the mysterious life forms in the red rain and the strange lights. I think the cells in this red rain sample may well have come from the meteorite. He's using a powerful electron microscope to scan the meteorite for red rain cells. If he finds them here, it could be the proof of alien life he's been looking for. Excuse me, that's the potential red rain. That's the potential red rain there, isn't it? We are finding these cells right in the deep interior of the meteorite. So, could these strange creatures pose a threat to human life? The fact that the red rain cells have no DNA might be a cause for some concern because these cells, if they interact with living cells on the Earth, might produce some harmful effects. So there could be a serious risk of a pandemic that might even wipe out the whole of mankind. Still, no one knows exactly what these strange cells are and the precise threat they pose to our planet. There's a huge amount that remains unexplained. When I was a 15-year-old lad living in Salford, I looked up at the night sky and saw a UFO. I've been obsessed with all things extraterrestrial ever since. Now I'm on a mission to find out more about what I saw. I'm Sean Ryder, and I'm coming to history. It's no hoax. Brand new Sean Ryder on UFOs. Starts Sunday the 10th of November on history. Let's try this. You tell me when I say something that isn't true. Six flying disks, maybe a hundred feet across, hollow, in the center. 
One of them is failing. You wonder if it'll crash into your boat. It happens very fast. You can feel it, like a bomb. 